Um, so, many of you might know that I worked at TypeSafe and then Lightbend. Um, so, this is says something different. Uh, I passed on the baton as the ACA tech lead to Patrick three months ago and joined a new founded st uh, startup, Actix, uh, of which I am a co-founder and the CTO. Uh, switch completely, um, building a production management system for small and medium size manufacturing enterprises in Europe. That's the target so far. And uh, the only thing that I'm going to tell you about this in this presentation is that we're, of course, hiring. Uh, but the, the presentation is about something completely different. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, the presentation has the same title as this book uh, that Jamie and I started. Um, Brian Hanafi joined now as a co-author uh, to finish the last steps. Um, it is currently uh, in the Manning Early Access, Access Program and basically finished. Uh, the we just sent um, uh, most chapters to pre-production, so I expect it to come out later this summer. Uh, if you want to um, get it a bit cheaper, you can um, go via rolandkuhn.com, there's the, the code, or you can use this code as well. Uh, that's the same one, if you don't want to note it down. So, reactive design patterns. Uh, that's the topic of this presentation. Uh, normally, I used to have a really long introduction of what this reactive thing is, but I think we have gone past the need to go through that in detail. Uh, who here knows what uh, reactive means? Okay, who has actually read the Reactive Manifesto? Who has signed it? <laughs> okay, that's less people. <laughs> um, but I, I didn't check the numbers. It's, it's five digits uh, since a long while, so it's quite a, quite a popular thing. Um, anyway, in order to motivate some of the things that come later, I will go through quickly. Uh, the first pillar, as I regard uh, th this, um, this whole topic to be constructed, is as elasticity. If you build something uh, that's cool and people start using it and then it falls over because it can't deal with the load, you can't scale it up, uh, then, well, you didn't build anything that will be long-term useful because someone might just come see it doesn't work, hmm, just a fad, goes away. Uh, that nearly happened to Twitter, but they had the resources to turn it around to redesign the system, uh, which is one of, of the examples that we look at uh, when we um, study big reactive systems. So first of all, you need to be able to scale, and that needs um, the, the, the fact that you distribute your computation across multiple nodes, because a, a single node obviously has a limit as to how many uh, requests it can process, users it can support, data it can store, and so on. So this forces distribution. There is another very important point, and that is the second pillar, namely resilience. Resilience means that we know things will fail. Hardware will fail, software will fail, um, anything can fail. Hu humans can do the wrong thing. They can replace the wrong hard drive and everything is lost. So. You, don't, you simply don't put all eggs in one basket, which means, again, that you need to distribute, not in order to scale out, but in order to not lose everything when one location, whether that be a data center or a simple com single computer, is inaccessible for a while. They don't need to uh, crash and burn. It, it, it's sufficient that the digger digs up a glass fiber uh, and then nothing works anymore. So you need to distribute for that reason as well. Now, um, these are the two main pillars um, that you might regard as being forced into distribution for these reasons, um, but you get a lot of benefits from that as well. Uh, the first one I would like to highlight is responsiveness, of course. Uh, that's also at the top of the diagram at the Reactive Manifesto, uh, which means that whatever you write will keep responding even when things fail or when the load varies greatly, you can just scale up and down to meet the demand uh, so your system stays responsive. But there are other benefits as well. Uh, if you do that, if you design your system such that it can with, uh, withstand uh, failure, e even unforeseen failures like that digger and the glass fiber, um, you will need to consider that your components cannot be very strongly coupled. They need the ability to live on when something over there has failed. And this decoupling means uh, that you can deal with failures that 
that were entirely unforeseen because you sim simply say, okay, this has failed. I don't care how or why, but it's simply not there. I need to do my best uh, to, to keep working. Um, the uh, next one is you split up your system because that's what the decoupling does. Uh, and you split up your system into components that are independent uh, from each other. And in order to be really independent, they shall not only decouple at runtime, um, they also cannot share like 95% of the code in most cases because likelihood in all likelihood you will have made the same programming error in both. Uh, so they will probably fail in the same uh, scenario. So they are not decoupled anymore. This means that you will have to choose a software architecture, um, which naturally means that you can scale to a, a large number of teams working on them. They can have independent release cycles. That's the whole microservices idea. And as a, uh, as a last one, I would like to mention that even if you don't use ACA, right, um, and this is not a talk about ACA, um, you will need to consider messages flowing in your system as the first class construct. You need to look at where information flows, how it flows, and what you do if, if it doesn't flow. Uh, what how you react to when a message does not arrive that you expect it. So it's all about messages. Um, messages also does not necessarily mean, as I said, actors, or it doesn't even mean that you need uh, to use some sort of message broker, uh, 0MQ, AMQP, whatever. Um, you could also use HTTP for transferring messages. You, know, you post it to some endpoint and then you've delivered a message. Um, HTTP is a round trip already, but that's just a physical transport you could consider. You have delivered something there, and then someone else makes a request, opens a WebSocket maybe, and gets some messages back. Uh, it's all about messages that flow, and that is just how you need to think about these systems, even if you don't explicitly use the actor model. I'd like to, to bring these all together I in, a, in a form that is not exactly the picture you know from the reactive manifesto. Uh, it's quite similar in that um, Elastic and Resilient are in the middle tier. They are the means by which we implement all the nice things on top. And um, they all force distributed design and message-driven thinking, uh, which is at the bottom, which is the form uh, these systems take. I would like to make one more point, though. Um, we, we see that these systems need to be distributed, uh, and we want to get all these benefits. Um, but being distributed also means, as, as Sergey uh, pointed out, um, distributed systems are hard. You don't really want to do them if you don't need to. Uh, but if you only have the rule, well, it's hard, don't do it if you don't need to, um, well, that's true, but it's not very helpful. So uh, I think it is crucial that everybody who d designs, implements uh, these systems uh, needs to understand some basics about distributed systems. You can't abstract it away, give it to some other library to solve it for you. You need to really understand what the thing does. And that's what the rest of this talk is about. So, um, let's talk first about architecture patterns. And then we have another part um, uh, for implementation patterns. In this presentation, I'll keep this part really short. Uh, if you want to see it, uh, I have uh, given the presentation with that part expanded uh, several times. You can find it uh, on the internet. Uh, this is just an overview. So uh, three main patterns uh, that are usually presented and that are also uh, in the book, of course. All of this is in the book and, and lots more is in the book as well. Uh, so you can read it up, uh, read up on it there. So the first one um, is the simple component pattern. Some people call it the single responsibility principle. Uh, it's actually very old. It was uh, published uh, in 1979 uh, by DeMarco uh, in this book, Structured Analysis and System Specification. And, uh, well, it's a whole book on the topic, uh, of course, but uh, the main point is to maximize cohesion and minimize coupling uh, between your components. So uh, it basically means you need to figure out a responsibility that is clearly denoted, and everything that belongs to this responsibility is inside this one component, and it has a clear boundary. Nothing is inside that's outside of the responsibility, and nothing that's inside the responsibility is implemented elsewhere. You concentrate the responsibility in one component. One caveat, I mean, 
so you, you break down your system saying, okay, this is an overall responsibility, now I can split it up into three smaller ones and so on. Uh, there is uh, the tendency that you apply these patterns just without thinking or, I mean, you get into the flow when you s keep splitting up your things. Um, this is not the trivial component pattern, right? Uh, you need to keep that in mind. So there needs to be a real responsibility in, in this component, otherwise um, it goes too fine-grained. The second one, the let it crash pattern, um, you know, the, the Akka team blog uh, it was uh, letitcrash.com, now it's more an aggregator of other blogs, but, um, but th that's at the core of the thinking behind the actor model, uh, that you, uh, instead of having sophisticated and ever more complex error handling within your component, um, you, you treat failure as a, as a valid state of your system and you just let it fail. So you scrap it, make a new one, uh, and that is much simpler to do uh, than trying to figure out how to fix a broken thing. So say you have corrupted your the, the, this the internal uh, state of your uh, whatever it is that you're doing um, by some mistake that you didn't foresee. It might be a race condition that only happens once a month uh, if it is full moon or something. And you can't debug it, right? There is a cost uh, up to which you can reasonably debug and fix things. And beyond that, it's simply not worth it. So for those, you install this catch-all that you say, okay, I design my components such that I can easily completely scrap them and create them anew. Um, that's the let it crash pattern. So, implementation patterns. Um, I'll start with a, a really tough one, right? Nobody has done that before. It's, it's completely outlandish. It's called the request response pattern. Uh, just to demonstrate, uh, but also to make a point. Um, because the, the essence, I mean, everybody does that implicitly, right? Like a child asks another child. I mean, we, we do that from, from early on uh, for something. You get a response. Everybody knows wha how that works. It's so ingrained that we don't really think about it. Um, I tried to formalize it, and I, sa and I found, uh, well, in order to make this work, you need to include a return address in the message in order to receive a response, because that's technically what you need. Uh, you can draw a picture. I made up this kind of diagramming uh, system. So A sends a request to B, includes its own address. That's what the dashed line says. And then that enables B to send back a response. Very simple. Um, it's also uh, often implicit. This is why you think it's trivial and you laughed, of course. Um, because in HTTP, the TCP connection carries all this imp uh, information implicitly. The HTTP request header does not say where the response shall go, of course, because there is an exclusive communications channel and there are just two directions to talk on it. So request goes one way, response goes the other way. Um, but uh, this magic is worked by TCP, which carries all this information in every packet with uh, the source and destination IP and port. Um, in Akka, we, had a, we have a similar fe feature in the untyped world, uh, which is the most lo widely used uh, right now, I gather, uh, that uh, the sending actor's self-reference is implicitly captured if you use Scala or you pass it if you use Java uh, in the tell method, um, so that this sender reference is available at the destination to send back uh, the, the response. Otherwise, there are many systems which don't have this. If you use a message broker, for example, you typically need to, s to include a channel name on which to respond, and then the, the, the one sending the request will have to listen on that queue. Uh, in Akka typed, um, well, I was so bold to remove the implicit sender capture because it caused so many problems, so there you now have to, have to do the same thing. Inside your message, you need to explicitly place a reference to the destination for the reply. The next pattern is also, I mean, that's one you have probably seen and heard and talked about, uh, the circuit breaker pattern. Protect services by breaking the connection during failure periods. Of course, this is Im uh, inspired by electrical engineering. You protect one part of an e electrical um, uh, circuit from another part by putting a circuit breaker in between, saying that when this draws too much current, uh, this shuts down so that this can still keep going. Uh, this analogy, um, yeah, does not does not work 100% in software. 
uh, this is why I write inspired by, because uh, what it is used for is to shield a client from the failures of a, servers, uh, a server, a service it is calling, um, but also the other way around. So it's about failures and not current normally. You can also use it to, to limit rate, of course, and then it's more like the electrical one. Um, this was first published by Michael Nygaard, uh, but uh, blogged about by, by others as well since, and uh, might be well known. Who has used it? it oh, so few. Okay, more should use it. Uh, if, you use, uh, if you build dis uh, distributed systems, you will need this. If you don't know that, um, think about it. So uh, you have this, uh, this component here trying to contact that over there and makes requests. And if the network connection breaks or if this, connect, uh, if this component is overloaded or whatever, doesn't respond, it doesn't really make sense to keep sending requests all the time and waiting for the timeouts to occur. You can conclude that, well, currently that other thing is not reachable. I don't need to bother, right? Uh, that means that instead of having this three-second timeout and the spinning wheel for your users and whatever it is, uh, you can just uh, respond with a negative reply right away. Uh, you could display, if it's a user page and the functionality was crucial, you can immediately say that it's currently not working, please check back in five minutes. Uh, or you can give degraded service. Uh, you can try to get the data from elsewhere where, where it's more expensive to get, or you can reduce the level of detail that you give to your users and say, Sorry, we can't present that right now, but here's what we have. This is all much better than having the web browser hanging and nobody knows what's going on. Um, this is for the client, but it, it, this is also very good for the service that you're calling because um, if you queue up all these requests uh, and, the service, um, uh, and the service is overloaded and gets, uh, keeps being more overloaded due to things timing out, sending yet another request, and all of these are actually sent, uh, then the backlog of this service will grow and grow and, and the system will completely fail at some point. So it's much better to, to conclude that this is currently not working for whatever reason, also for overload, and you stop sending requests. And then the service has some time to recover. Um, there are aspects, like it was swapping because it was using too many resources um, and that slowed it down. That will actually be fixed by letting the queues drain and so on and the system gets back uh, to normal behavior after some usage spike. Uh, that could well be. So this gives the service some breathing room to recover and that's uh, how it protects it from the clients as well. Uh, I have some, some bit of code. Uh, who here uh, used Akka before? That was most of, okay. Um, so this is, this is a, an example in Scala of the circuit breaker that we include. Um, if you have a uh, send to storage method that returns a future, uh, that's the thing, circuit breakers work with futures uh, in this implementation, then uh, you uh, make sure that failures are actually signaled to the circuit breaker and the circuit breaker reacts to exceptions. This is why there is a throw storage failed in there. Now, when you make an actual call, you first configure a circuit breaker with some settings. This one, uh, it needs a scheduler for scheduling the timeouts, and uh, you can tell it after uh, five uh, consecutive failures um, where taking more than 300 milliseconds is also considered a failure, uh, it shall open and then it will respond with a negative uh, response. And after 30 seconds, it goes into a half-closed state wh where it tries, does it work now? And if it does, it, it's closed again and everything is back to normal. If it doesn't, it snaps back open. Uh, so you use it like this, uh, as you say, breaker with circuit breaker, and you give the code to be called if the circuit breaker is closed. This is, this is a, a lambda here, basically. Uh, this is, this is a... Um, um, call, call by name uh, argument, which is not even evaluated if the circuit breaker is open. So in that case, uh, when, it, it, when it's open, you immediately get back the circuit breaker open exception and you respond to that in any way you see fit. So uh, everything clear so far? Okay, uh, now we tackle something which is a lot more difficult. And uh, please ask questions, uh, by the way. Yeah, I it's, it's completely expected that you ask questions. So, uh, multi-master replication patterns. Um, 
we have seen presentations uh, on this conference as well about uh, so y when you go distributed you want to keep your data of course shut such that it's safe it needs to be in multiple locations but how do you update the data well you might want to be able to contact all the replicas any of them should work uh, for for updates and for reads and and you expect uh, all, all things to be nice, basically. So it should just work, for example, like a single database, if that's your goal. Um, that would be multi-master replication, um, where you yeah, keep multiple distributed copies, accept updates everywhere, and the replicas then have this funny task of making sure that everyone is on the same page. The problem with this is, and, and, and that's why I, why I said you need to understand a bit about distributed systems, this is a tough problem with no perfect solution. Let that sink in, right? There is no, I want this, in all cases, perfect solution to this problem. Because it always requires a trade-off to be made uh, between consistency and avail availability. Who knows about the CAP theorem? So, th yeah, uh, that's, that's good. Uh, who has read the article, uh, the CAP theorem, 12 years later? That's not so many people. Okay, so the CAP theorem basically um, used a formulation uh, that said something like you have consistency, availability, and partition tolerance, and you need to pick two. You can't have all three. Um, what is explained? I mean, this, this was really useful to, to tell people, okay, something, something is going on. You can't have uh, everything. You can't win on all fronts. Um, but what was overlooked is that for example, the C in CAP uh, stands for serializability, which is an extremely strong guarantee to give. Uh, so only this form of consistency and only perfect availability is included, uh, excluded during a network partition. So that the, 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 the other paper then uh, goes to explain, okay, you can, you can g get very close to the ideal. Um, you need to sacrifice just a little bit. But anyway, so this is where the, the traditional um, tra uh, trade-off between consistency and availability comes from because, because you cannot opt out of network partitions, right? That, that should be clear. You cannot define them away. They will happen. Uh, a GC pause on the JVM is a network partition, effectively. So um, we will talk about uh, roughly uh, a, a, a sketch because this, this could fill a week of workshops. Uh, we, we will talk about uh, three uh, ways to tackle this. The first one, consensus-based, uh, which focuses on consistency, which tries to give you the maximum consistency that you might want to get from the system, and foregoes availability, of course, a bit. Um, Conflict-free, that's on the exact opposite of the spectrum, where you sacrifice certain consistency guarantees in order to obtain perfect availability. And then there is conflict resolution, as I call it. Uh, it has many names, and it's very popular, as you will see, uh, which kind of gives up a bit of both. So the thing is, each of these requires a different programming model, gives you different guarantees, gives, it gives you dif different advantages, and you need to pick. So what, what are these things? The first, consensus-based. Uh, I think that is mm, most natural to consider. Uh, most most simple um, to reason about. Um, it means that all replicas need to constantly talk uh, with each other to stay on the same page. Everybody needs to confirm what everyone else has done. Uh, every everything that happens in the system needs to be agreed, at least by a quorum, um, so that everyone will be on the same page. No one can see that A happens before B while another sees that B happens before A. That would violate uh, everything and, and bring down the consistency uh, of the system. But this means that during network partitions or uh, certain mach machine failures, the system will need to become unavailable. Because if consensus cannot be reached, for example, you split your network in three partitions of equal size, none of these partitions can make sure that it is the winning one because there is no communication possible. Um, yeah, during these periods, the system cannot accept updates uh, or it would need to shut itself down or, or whatever because that might be inconsistent. The advantage, though, is uh, that you program it just like it, like as if it was a single thread. 
Uh, that is the huge bonus, and that is why um, almost all databases uh, in, the, in, in the past have gone for this, uh, have seen this as the ideal to provide to users. Because you write your transactions, and in the transaction you're supposed to not feel anything of any other tra transaction. You can, you can look at the database and as if you had it exclusively. Um, that's the goal. And, and you don't need to reason about other things that might happen concurrently because the database somehow slots things in such that one seems to happen exactly after the other one. Um, this is actually implemented in Postgres, Zookeeper or any of the databases based on, on Raft. Um, there are options for doing that. Um, but as I said, um, these will be unavailable during network partitions. The next one a replication with conflict resolution. This is kind of basically similar, but during a network partition, the system does not shut down. It optimistically accepts updates. Uh, if you look at, for example, Oracle cluster, um, that's what it will do uh, in certain conditions. And, uh, well, uh, so you accept updates at both sides of a network split. Um, they might update the same row, same column, with different values. So what do you do now? When the network partition ends, the both sides will compare their transaction logs and they will see, oh, uh, we screwed up. We need to fix this somehow. Uh, but the APIs that these databases give you um, do not allow this resolution uh, to be handed to the user saying, oh, we have this. Uh, how, do, how shall we fix it? Uh, therefore, a choice is made inside the database to pick one over the other might be time timestamp based or whatever um, model it is. The thing is, the system will have to choose one of the two values, fundamentally. And that means one of the rights will be lost. And that may mean that some things might not be consistent afterwards. Uh, th so this is this little asterisk risk you see. Um, for Oracle, it's, it's unbreakable and it's, it's uh, consistent and so on, and there's this asterisk, right? Uh, <laughs> Because uh, almost, uh, almost all critical systems that you think of today are implemented on this basis. So it seems to work well enough. These partitions are rare. Uh, they don't happen all the time. And when they happen, well, there is an error in the database. Ha so how do, we ha how do we deal with it? Someone will find it. Maybe a customer will complain about it. Then we give the customer some extra to make them happy. Um, right? So uh, perfect, um, perfect consistency is not achievable while wanting decent performance and all these things, so we make these kind of compromises. Um, so the programming model that you use with this is still like a single thread and you assume that things don't go wrong. When they do, well, you need to fix them otherwise. The last one, the extreme one, that is conflict-free replication. Uh, this is something that is actually new, uh, as in less than 10 years old. Uh, I think the paper from Mark Shapiro was uh, appeared 2010 or so, uh, summarizing that very young field uh, of uh, academic research. Um, th the idea here is that you express updates such that there cannot ever be a conflict by construction. What does that mean? So if I have a counter and I want to replicate that counter, uh, I have this counter in two locations, and one client contacts this location and says increment by two, and the other one says to the other uh, replica imp increment by three. Let's say the counter was three before, so it's five here, six there. If you just do it like that, and these two replicas exchange notes to figure out what happened, um, well, you are you will not be able to solve this because, you again, you need to pick one over the other. One of the updates will be lost. So the idea is that instead of having one counter inside the data structure, you actually have one counter per node. And this counter uh, for machine A is only updated by machine A, and the counter for machine B is only updated by machine B. So when they compare nodes, uh, they see, okay, uh, A has updated, and that updates the counter for A at location B, and the other way around. So they both will, will arrive at the same state in the end. And when you try to retrieve the, the final value of the counter, you at, at one location you just need to add up all these individual counters, and that means that you get the, the sum that has happened in, uh, everywhere in the system. Is this clear? For a counter it's reasonably simple. If you want to model, for example, a set where you can only 
put things into the set that's still also simple. If you want to be able to take things out of the set again, it becomes a hell of a lot more complicated, but there are solutions for those. So that has been done already. Not all possible data structures can be expressed, but um, a, a large group of them. Um, such that, so you can deal with single items, like, like a single set or a single counter, in a way that you can always do updates and there will never be conflicts. That's great, isn't it? So uh, wha what are the problems with this? Anyone know? Yes, yes, that is exactly the problem. You cannot model things that, try, uh, that, that uh, keep global constraints. So if you were to model a counter uh, that, can only, um, that cannot be incremented beyond a thousand, then you have problems because you don't know whether you were the last one who, con who, who, who consumed the last available tokens, so to speak. There are, there are solutions for that for a single side bounded counter, uh, but I think there is no solution for, for a counter that is both bounded on the lo low end and on the high end, for example. So, yeah, you cannot model everything. Um, the other problem is that you have these replicas and they are talking and they are serving uh, read requests, of course. So if you have, uh, the counter was three and it was incremented to five here, six there, um, clients might see, uh, five and, and, and then eight, and clients might see six and then eight, right? So if a client contacts re replica A, it might see a different history of events than if it contacted B. Uh, this is not serializable. This is not what the classical database gives you. This is a different programming model. Um, you also need to, uh, to consider that these updates take time to disseminate, so uh, it's only eventually consistent. Eventually all the replicas will reach the same state, um, but not immediately and not in a defined order of steps. Um, this means that uh, you need to write your code differently if you work with these systems. Implementations of those are, uh, for example, React 2.0, which has been a great inspiration for uh, ACA distributed data. Uh, I think there are, there are other, I mean, these are being used in more and more places, and we will see more solutions um, popping up that make use of this, because that's the only way to actually achieve perfect availability with some reasonable uh, consistency guarantees. Um, there, are, there are better consistency guarantees that we could reach in principle, namely causal consistency, but I, I'm not sure how tractable that will be. Um, depends on future research that has not yet been conducted. The point of this, the point of discussing this as a, as a reactive design pattern is, um, well, you need to think about this. Yeah, there is no, uh, no solution, as I said, no perfect solution. You need to, to pick what you need. If you need perfect consistency, well, go for consensus. If you need perfect availability, use something like CRDTs or whatever comes up and, and, and is better than that. Um, but the point is, you need to consciously make these trade-offs. You need to know what you're doing. Uh, if you just say, oh, I'll buy Oracle and they'll solve it, solve it for you, well, you buy a, a whole host of implicit assumptions that were made while constructing this product and you better understand them so that you can, you can pick uh, the right solution. So, the last pattern that I'm going to discuss because it comes up very often is the saga pattern. Divide long-lived distributed transactions into quick local ones with compensating actions for recovery. Um, this, uh, th th this I made up. About, uh, um, I, I took some, some old um, pattern. Um, I'll, I'll tell you where it came from. By adding the distributed in there. That was not in there before. Uh, but the problem is exactly the same. Um, this comes up mostly when you look at microservice architectures. Microservices... Um, well, I mean, everybody has heard the term. Uh, who has actually built microservices-based systems? Uh, many people, right. So um, what comes up often also on the mailing list and so on is the question, if I have these microservices and each is supposed to own its data and I can't have distributed transactions, how do I do something that needs to touch two microservices and it shall happen all or none? It should be... Uh, an all-or-nothing thing. It should be atomic 
in a sense. Uh, if I can't have distributed transactions with automatic rollback, how do I do this? Um, well, for, for some, uh, some more background of why this is a real problem and why, it, why there is no magic wand that, th that you can use to, to uh, um, scroll it away somehow, um, is uh, you, you should read these papers by Pat Helland. He, he explains quite uh, well uh, what, what the deeper problems are and, and how you can get around, uh, around some limitations and not around some others. So, the actual pattern. Also pretty old, paper from 1987. Uh, most of these things that, that I'm talking about are not really new. Uh, they are just um, being applied uh, in different contexts now or being applied for the first time because when they were invented, uh, they were far ahead. I think this was not uh, far ahead in the sense that it was not applied. Uh, for some reason, I don't know, the, the, the title of the paper is Sagas in all caps. If someone knows, please tell me. That's a mystery still. Uh, it was written uh, by, uh, by um, Hector Garcia Mol uh, Molina and the and, um, uh, first name of Salem, I forgot. Um, so, the, to, to illustrate what it does, let's consider, let's consider the fake example of a bank transfer. You all know it's fake, right? You know how banks transfer money? It, it's not by doing a, da a database transaction. Yeah, they don't lock the two accounts, actually. But let's consider that we want to do it anyway, because um, th this, this demonstrates uh, how you go about things. And this is also how banks actually do it, more or less. So you split up the transaction that touches accounts uh, um, uh, X and Y uh, in, in one transaction. You split it up in two transactions, assuming that X and Y are hosted, for example, by different microservices. Or they might be at dif different banks. Uh, so the first transaction will transfer the money from X to some local working account. The second transaction will transfer it from the working account to Y, which means that you don't need to touch X and Y in the same transaction. Uh, but now the question is, what shall happen if something goes wrong? Well, you need to roll back. So there is a compensating action, C1, uh, that mirrors T1 in that it transfers back the money from the local uh, working account to the account X. Um, there is one obvious drawback with this, which is uh, the, the one on the last line. Um, well, the, the transaction is broken, right, in two steps. So uh, it's no more, uh, we, we've broken isolation from the asset part. We can still make it atomic so that everything happens or none happens, uh, but it's no longer isolated. In general, what it looks like uh, is that you apply partial transactions, T1, T2, T3, and then you need to foresee the ability to roll them all back if something goes wrong. So you have compensating actions and you execute them in re reverse order, of course. Yeah. So um, that, that would be the backward recovery. Uh, you can also do forward or try forward recovery. So you do transaction one and then you save to disk. It's a SP is a save point. And then you do transaction two and you save. When the system crashes in between, it will pick up at that location and go forward, continue going forward. Of course, this only works uh, if these transactions actually can succeed. Uh, if there is a permanent failure, like account Y has been deleted in the meantime, um, then, well, you need to recover backwards, of course. Um, yeah, is that clear so far? Yeah, good. I have some code, actually, to show that this is not just something I picked out of a paper. You can just use ACA persistence uh, to transliterate this process uh, in, into code. This is the, the setup. We have an account with withdraw and deposit methods that return futures, whatever, however they are implemented. Uh, we have a uh, transfer as a command. It's a case class with three fields, the amount, the account, accounts X and Y. And then we have certain events that characterize how far along in the process we are. The first one is transfer started, which records um, the, the parameters of the transfer command that we have received. The second one is money withdrawn. So we know X doesn't have the money anymore, we have it. Money deposited means we deposited it successfully into account Y. And rolled back means there was a problem with that and we put it back into account X. So this transfer saga, uh, um, as I call it, um, is a persistent actor that has an ID. 
it needs an ID uh, that is configured because when you uh, when the system crashes and comes back online, uh, this saga needs to resume, needs to restart, uh, be rehydrated from disk from the events, uh, and then pick up uh, at the step that should be uh, should be done next. So the initial behavior is to wait for the transfer command. Um, then we persist that we received this, saying persist transfer started. And then we change into the withdraw money mode. Withdraw money is the function that will be invoked once the transfer started event has been persisted on disk and has come back from the journal as a confirmation. So we have this transfer started um, as an argument. So we can call uh, x.withdraw for the amount. Uh, and we also include the ID. The thing is, this can happen more than once. Because if this actor um, fails or the whole system crashes after the withdrawal has been done, but before it has been persisted that it has been done, um, we, we will do it again, of course. So this is at least once um, execution of this process. Uh, and the idea me uh, ID means that the receiving account can see, okay, in my transaction log, oh, I I've seen this transaction already. I'm, I will not do it again. I will just say that I have already done it. Uh, and this is how you get a um, reliable execution of code. You cannot, uh, who here believes uh, that you can get ex exactly once execution of code? I hope no one, because it's impossible. Um, so many, many people thought about this. Uh, it, it can't be done, uh, like quantum mechanically impossible. Um, so this is why at least once is, a, is what you need to use uh, if you want uh, to execu execute something reliably. And at least once need means you need to deduplicate, hence the idea. Okay, once this has been successful, we map it to the money withdrawn event and use pipe to self to send it back to the same actor. And then we change behavior to await money withdrawn. When we get this, we persist this, this knowledge that we have withdrawn the money, and we go to deposit money mode. Deposit money does the same thing uh, as, as withdraw money, just deposits money into Y, and then when successful, um, persists or, or turns that into a money deposited event, pipes to self, and goes into await money deposited mode, and once that comes back, well, here I have actually implemented failure handling. I have not done that in the first slide. This is not, don't implement your production system based on this code, right? Um, so uh, th this one, if there is a failure, we actually need to roll back. That's what I wanted to, to show here. So we call x.deposit deposit for the amount, if, if we failed to put it into the y account. Map that back to the rolled back uh, event, pipe to self, and uh, await the completion of that one. Otherwise, if the money has been persisted, uh, we store that in the event log so we know, yeah, this has been done, and then we can stop this saga. It has been successful. Here, you could tell whoever gave the, the transfer command, yes, it's done, for example. Um, so, saga is done, finished. Uh, there's one very important part missing here, of course, and that's the receive recover in an ACA persistent actor that models the replay. Yeah. Um, so if the system crashes at any of these points um, and then is restarted, the actor will come back up online. It will have the same ID, hopefully, so that it will replay the right event stream. And these get, get passed into the receive recover behavior. So for the transfer started, we record the parameters because, um, because we need them. Uh, as a start, but also as the last event that we have seen. Otherwise, we just keep track of the last event, so any other event just overwrites the, the last variable. And then once the recovery is completed, we can match, we can look at what was the last state that we have reached. Um, case null means we didn't even get the start command, so we'll just keep waiting for that one. Uh, otherwise, we do what, what should come next. If the transfer was started, we withdraw money. If it was withdrawn, we try to deposit. Um, if it was already deposited or rolled back, then, well, this saga was actually finished, but nobody um, got the memo, so it started it again. So we'll tell them again, probably, that this was already finished. Is that clear so far? Right? This is how you can do some sort of transaction. So it's, it's A, because it runs to completion or, or goes back to the initial state. Uh, so it's it's um, atomic in that sense. 
but it's uh, and it keeps consistency of the system eventually, uh, or it can also keep this, uh, the consistency at all times. For example, if if you want to do analytics on your bank accounts, uh, you will see the money missing from X and not yet at Y if you run your analytics at at the wrong point in time. But if you keep into in uh, into account also all the local working accounts of the sagas that might be running, you still have consistency. The money will not be gone, you know, so you can fix it. Um, yeah, it will be durable, but it will not be isolated, of course. The funny thing here is, uh, when reading this paper, I, <laughs> uh, I, I smiled at a few locations. Uh, th these are the, uh, the quotes. So, so they write, search for natural divisions of the work being performed. Um, the context here was, you have, I mean, this was in the, in the 80s, you have a single um, core, single CPU system uh, running a single threaded database. That was the context. It was not a distributed system. Uh, and, and the problem was, if you had a long-running transaction, then that would, well, run for a long time, and any other clients of the system would not be able to collect. Um, so the question was, okay, I need to break this up to make the system more responsive. That was even for a single-threaded problem. Uh, so you search for uh, natural partitions in your data, and you, you group them together, and you make sub-transactions for these natural groups. That sounds a lot like microservices to me. It is the database itself that is naturally partitioned into relatively independent components. That's the, data, that's the statement, the microservice owns its data. That's the same thing. The database and the saga should be designed so that dot data passed from one sub-transaction to the next via local storage is minimized. Um, that means you shouldn't share state. It's, it's again the same thing with microservices. Y you, should, you should think about the communication protocols between your components and minimize uh, the, the, the chatter and have basically only that which is, which is necessary. The same thing uh, was considered here in a completely different context. Uh, and, and I like that very much. It's kind of reactive full circle. Okay, that brings me to my conclusion. Reactive systems are, in their nature, distributed for various reasons, as I pointed out. Um, this requires some architecture patterns, uh, well, that for some might be new, but most of which are actually quite old. Um, and they are helped by some new or old um, code patterns and abstractions uh, that are rediscovered or have been discovered a long time ago. And the point of this is, well, distribution is not easy, but you can actually think about it, and you, you have tools to tackle it. Thank you. Uh, hi. In the beginning, you mentioned that, um, if possible, components should be developed by separate teams, kind of independent of each other, uh, to kind of increase redundancy. But then how do you ensure that they don't actually diverge and the components still work together after a period of independent development? Well, of course, you need to think about the protocols via which their components interact and also the protocols by which uh, the teams interact. You need to set up these, these responsibilities. That's the point. Uh, if you have the responsibility for a certain part or feature concentrated in this one component, it's also concentrated in this one team. And if someone else sees something of this responsibility popping up, they know exactly who to talk to. Uh, and, and this helps greatly um, simplify the interactions. 